Coming up on DTNS, Amazon's smart shopping cart for grocery stores, the UK bans Huawei from its 5G networks, and a robot platform with reach. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. We were just talking about the Queen of Cows and Milo Ventimiglia in Good Day Internet. If you want that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google will prevent users who aren't logged in into a Google account from joining Google Meet sessions hosted by G Suite for Education or G Suite Enterprise for Education subscribers. Over the next 15 days, the option will be turned on and can only be turned off by contacting G Suite support. The Wall Street Journal's sources say that SoftBank has hired Goldman Sachs to explore the possibility of a sale of ARM or ARM. CNBC sources say SoftBank was preparing for an ARM uh, IPO but received interest from an outside party about a possible sale. Dun, dun, dun. It wasn't me. Uh, Spotify is adding two podcast charts in 26 countries to be updated daily. A chart called Trending ranks 50 shows partially on the speed of growth in listener numbers and a chart called Top ranks the 200 most popular shows overall, localized by region. Top also includes subcategories like business, comedy, and technology in some of the regions. Google's Play Pass app subscription service is now available in Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, New Zealand, Spain, and the UK. The service launched in the U.S. back in September of 2019. All right. Let's talk a little more about those smart carts, Patrick. Let's, uh, but not before I've told you that uh, apparently Le Rendez-vous Tech is on the top 100 on Spotify for free. Oh, congrats. That's awesome. So, uh, thank you. Amazon plans to open a grocery store in a Los Angeles suburb later this year. The grocery store will not have the wide array of cameras and sensors used in an Amazon Go store to track what you take off the shelves and charge you automatically when you leave. Instead, Amazon announced the Dash Cart, a shopping cart with a touchscreen and sensors to detect what you put into your cart. A ring of cameras uh, detects most items. Things like produce let you input a price code before you put the item in your cart. Once you're done shopping, you take the cart uh, dash, you take the dash cart through a special checkout lane that calculates your total without needing a human cashier. The cart can only handle up to two bags of groceries. So this grocery store will have normal checkout with cashiers if you need more than two bags of groceries. It's just uh, if you don't have that much, uh, you can use the dash card. And I, I don't know, Sarah, it kind of strikes me as the self-checkout, but in your cart. Yeah, exactly. it, it, there's the whole Amazon Go, which I, I've never tried. Uh, there's one in San Francisco, which would be the closest to me. And I just I, I've not had the opportunity to, you know, check it out yet. You know, that is a slow rollout. Um, I would love to think that this would work for not just Amazon, but lots of other grocers in, in a future world, you know, and just have a lot of less contact, less, you know, payment situations, especially when you're on the go. All good. But this is not, you know, our reality today. So the idea that Amazon's like, okay, we got Whole Foods, we have our kind of, you know, futuristic Amazon Go situation. And then we got something in the middle here. It's an Amazon grocery store that's neither of these grocery stores. And we're just going to see how this works with folks, see how it catches on. And I, I like the idea of it. I mean, you know, my initial reaction is like, eh, you got to input stuff for your own produce, blah, 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 you know. But I think that, you know, folks kind of wanting, especially these days, wanting to uh, have limited uh, interaction with other people. This is a this is a very good timing move. And Amazon has always been really good at trying many different things and uh, kind of seeing what sticks uh, out of the many many different types of pasta they throw at the wall. Uh, this also seems like it might be a little bit more. Um, easily accepted by privacy conscious people because it's really as you said tom it's a self-checkout counter in your cart 
So it's really nothing that concerning. And uh, it's also probably, it seems, more easily integratable into any kind of existing mm -hmm. um, grocery store. Maybe they're going to sell the technology and get all the data from everyone. Amazon Go is the brand for the whole uh, sensor array stuff. It's mostly convenience stores, but they have two grocery stores in Seattle, but those are smaller grocery stores. I have seen this Amazon grocery store that is not Go branded. Uh, it's not open yet, but I've seen it from the outside. It's huge. It's an old Toys R Us. Uh, it's gargantuan. It's over in Woodland Hills. And, and so, yes, I think you guys are right. This is Amazon trying something out saying, okay, our Go system just doesn't scale to a store this size, but Patrick, you're right. We want to sell this technology to other people because that's what Amazon does, right? They develop cloud systems for their book selling and then turn that into AWS and sell their cloud services to other people. That's, that's proven to be incredibly successful. So I imagine that that's what they're doing here is saying, let's figure out how this works for us probably create our own grocery stores using the in-house experience we get from the Whole Foods folks uh, to operate it. And then once we've proven it, we can sell this to the large grocery stores that wouldn't be able to take advantage of the entirely cashierless system that is Amazon Go, because it just doesn't scale up that hard or that far. Well, moving on, UK Digital Minister Oliver Dowden announced that telcos may not buy 5G equipment from ZTE or Huawei starting in January of 2021. Existing equipment from the vendors must be removed by 2027. The new policy must still be passed by Parliament. Now, back in January, the National Cybersecurity Center determined that Huawei's equipment could be used as long as it wasn't in the core infrastructure. Then the U.S. introduced new restrictions to prevent companies from selling parts to Huawei if they use U.S.-based parts or IP. That means that Huawei would have to source chips from new vendors. And the U.K. says, well, we can't properly vet for that kind of security. So 5G rollouts in the U.K. are expected to be delayed two to three years as a result of the new policy. The ministry will now begin consultations on what to do about non-5G networks. Meanwhile... Huawei reported year-over-year -year revenue growth of 13.1% for the first half of 2020. Consumer business accounted for 56% of its revenue, with carrier businesses making up to making up at 35%. Huawei's profit margin increased from 8.7% last year to 9.2% this year. So Huawei weathering COVID-19 and the U.S. trade restrictions, which started last year, uh, fairly well to date, uh, be probably better than a lot of people would have expected, uh, but they are facing increasingly uh, heavy uh, countercurrents, and the UK is one of them. Here's the interesting thing to me. The UK is saying very reasonably, I think, the Cybersecurity Center is saying, well, wait a minute. Now that Huawei can't use the parts that we vetted from TSMC and others, uh, they'll be using parts from manufacturers, most likely within China, that we can't properly vet. And so, therefore, we can't say they're secure. We can't, we can't properly vet that. That would mean that new build-outs wouldn't be able to use new Huawei systems. But it doesn't explain why they're now saying, the digital ministry is now saying, you also have to go pull the old stuff out because those have been vetted as being okay for the non-core network. So there is a political aspect to this that isn't reflected in the finding from the NCSC. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's a... Um consequence, secondhand consequence of the U.S.'s claims, allegations, war, whatever you want to uh, say about them. And it does, even though Huawei has fared well, as you said, um, even through the COVID crisis, it does put the pressure on them. And France has also been saying, even though they don't have a problem um, well, they don't have as much of a problem with Huawei uh, as the U.S., we're also having to reevaluate how much of their hardware we're going to be using for the exact same reasons. Um, so it it certainly seems like whether or not it is a trade uh, tactic by the American government, it is having an effect that is beyond their direct um, uh, uh, banning of the company in locally. And it's going to delay UK rollout. It's going to cost UK telecoms to do this. 
Uh, it doesn't seem to be immediately hurting Huawei, though it still could. Huawei probably is going to try to make up what it will lose from the UK and the US and any potential other European vendors by selling to Russia, by selling to Ch Africa, by selling to possibly India. Uh, although it's it's still touch and go which way India is going to go because India is not real friendly with China. But certainly Russia and Africa would be potential markets there, uh, probably Iran uh, and a few other markets as well. So uh, what again, this is another example of how technology is going to continue to be segmented uh, rather than, than be a worldwide global market. You're going to have places in the world that have uh, cheap, uh, proven Huawei networks that may have some security flaws. Uh, the NCSC found it to be maybe not intentional, but to, to have vulnerabilities. And then you'll have other parts of the world that will roll out slower because they're having to change tactics here. NBC streaming platform Peacock launches to everyone in the U.S. on July 15th. The free tier with ads will have about 13,000 hours of programming. Paid tiers will have about 20,000 hours. Uh, so you, you get more content if you pay, but it's not bad on the free tier. The paid tier will cost you $5 a month with ads or $10 a month if you don't want any ads at all. Broadcast shows from NBC's broadcast networks will be available the next week on the free tier. So if you watch This Is Us, uh, it'll air. And then the next week, it'll be available on the free tier of Peacock. Uh, if you pay, though, you get it the next day. Apps for Peacock are available for the PlayStation 4. They just announced that's coming July 20th. Uh, the Xbox, Apple TV, uh, Google Boxes like Android TV, Vizio, LG, Comcast, uh, the Flex TV box has it, and Cox. Uh, of course, Comcast owns NBC, so that makes sense. But Cox Cable will have it on their box as well. Peacock does not look like it will have apps on Roku or Fire TV. That is similar to HBO Max, which launched without apps for Roku or Fire TV as well. One of the main sticking points for both HBO Max and uh, Peacock have been that Roku and Amazon want to continue to sell these channels as add-ons to their own apps. The Roku has a Roku channel. And of course, Amazon has Prime Video. Add-ons would mean sharing more revenue, but also sharing the subscriber relationship. Peacock and HBO Max want to control both of those. Roku and Amazon also ask partners for ad inventory and a commitment to spend money on their platforms to market. Uh, and that's the amount that they want to spend is also in contention. So, I mean, if, if anything, this just points out that streaming's time has come because you've got the platforms saying, we have the leverage. You have to give us a sweetheart deal for revenue sharing. And we want to have a part in the subscriber relationship and make it really easy for people where the platforms themselves, like, like Peacock and HBO Max, want to control everything themselves. They do not want to give over that revenue and that subscriber relationship to Roku and Amazon. Yeah, I mean, if there were, I don't know, back in the day when Hulu launched, for example, you know, and it, you know, everyone's sort of going like, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's changed. It's, it's <laughs> taken on many forms, but the whole streaming model does work. How many of these streaming models are going to survive though? Not all of them, just not possible. People just aren't going to pay that kind of money. So yeah, it really comes down to a, a, you know, NBC saying with Peacock, this is what we want. And, you know, companies like Amazon and Roku saying, this is how you're going to win. And you're going to win by playing nice with us. And uh, not every company is doing that. Yeah, Roku and Amazon have 40 million, you know, so uh, or so uh, people. So they feel like if, if you want to survive, not even win, if you want to survive out yeah, there, really, right. uh, you need to be on our platform. We feel like we have the upper hand. And the and these these folks like Peacock and HBO Max are saying, we are not going to give in from the beginning. Uh, we don't want to start with a bad relationship just to get distribution. We feel like people will want to watch the things on our platform. Uh, and if you don't have them, you will suffer. It's it's exactly the thing that happens with, with cable TV uh, disputes. It's just happening for streaming and and in a world where people do have more choice. So with cable TV, you couldn't easily go somewhere else uh, to find your TV subscription. With this situation, if, if you don't like the fact that Roku doesn't have Peacock, you can switch to Apple TV or using your Xbox there. You do have more choices. 
Scientists from North Carolina State University and Microsoft will present a study at the ACM Joint European Software Engineering Conference and Symposium on the Foundations of Software Engineering in November on the effectiveness of technical job interviews. So, specifically, the study interviewed 48 computer science students. Half were given a technical problem to solve on a whiteboard with an interviewer watching in the same room, watching them as they do it. The other half solved a problem on a whiteboard in a private room. They were alone. Those in the private room didn't have to explain their solutions. They just came up with one, then talked about it afterwards. Performance was measured by the accuracy and efficiency of the solutions. Those who took the traditional interview performed about half as well as those who had a private room. And notably, all of the women in the public interview failed, and all of the women in the private interview succeeded. A larger sample size obviously needed to draw some firm conclusions, but this does shine some light on why, you know, this oh, this whole kind of like test taking thing under pressure is not necessarily going to give you the best candidate because they just might not work that well that way. Yeah, it, it, it seems obvious uh, that, you know, oh, uh, you won't perform as well uh, in front of someone. But the fact of the matter is some people do perform well in front of someone. And those are the people who got the job, especially if they had a pre-existing relationship or had something in common with the person in the room, because that reduces anxiety. Whereas if you feel like an outsider and you're unfamiliar, you're going to have potentially more performance anxiety. I, I really hope that there is more uh, studies made about this, because obviously this is an interesting uh, thing to look at from a an academic point of view, and it would have significant ramifications for the hiring process. But also the po part about all the women in the public interviews failing and all of them in the private interview failing is uh, kind of a, I don't want to say eye-opener, but it's, it's really striking. Um, and again, this sample size is very small. It's less than 50 people. So I would like to see how much of this is replicated among, uh, uh, with a, a larger sample size. And um, if it is, there could be other findings like this one that are um, interesting to take into account. And I think it's important to point out that it is in companies' best interest to pay attention to this, because if you are only hiring people that perform well on the interview, you may not be hiring the best people for your job. That's right. The, you know, the, just because you perform well on the whiteboard in front of the person doesn't mean you are the better coder uh, for this. So it's it's not a fair test of the skills you're trying to hire for. Yeah, I mean, if you you kind of like flip it uh, uh, flip it around a little bit, it's like okay, do, are you as a manager willing to stand over this person every time they're trying to solve a problem? <laughs> you know, no, that's not actually how the workplace works. You don't actually want that. It, it's, I mean, it's it's cool to have somebody who works well under pressure, but uh, a, a lot of people work differently. And especially in the engineering field, you, you know, you got to open it up. And, and you would think that maybe that's a stereotype, but coders might not be the ones that, do their best work under pressure, uh, having to present their, you know, back office workers. And the way the, the this test is, is presented, the, the study is basically saying you're testing for anxiety and presentation skills, not for coding. And that's yeah. not what you want when you want to hire coders. Definitely, right. definitely. All right. Uh, the Trusted News Initiative, or TNI, a coalition of publishers and tech companies, announced Project Origin, an attempt to combat disinformation by digitally water watermarking legitimate content. The watermark will be used to automatically f flag manipulated or fake content. Standards for Project Origin's, uh, Origin will be published in September. Audiences will see a small color indi indicator along with a message on the content or in the browser to verify the content is the original. TNI has successfully combated misinformation in the UK 2019 general election, the Taiwan 2020 election, and COVID-19. TNI is made up of Agence France Presse, the BBC, the Financial Times, First Draft, the Hindu, Reuters, the New York Times, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, Associated Press, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, along with Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Microsoft. Yeah, so up until now, and, and continuing into the U.S. election, uh, starting a month before the U.S. election this year, uh, TNI has, has worked on 
keeping each other informed. So, so members here and the technology companies help alert each other when uh, some misinformation is being spread so that the news outlets themselves don't fall for it. Uh, which you think they wouldn't, but sometimes in the you know scramble to cover, uh, it could be difficult. So this is this has proved very successful in preventing misinformation from being accidentally passed along. This project origin is very interesting because this is consumer facing. This is saying what we want to do is on an AFP story, we'll put this watermark, and that will be something we could train viewers to look for. People in the audience can say, well, if I don't see the little color badge there, then is it really the official story? Now, obviously there are ways to just put a color badge up. So it'll be very interesting to find out what the standards here are to prevent this from being faked uh, and actually make sure that that watermark you know, can't be subverted. Uh, but there are lots of ways in encryption uh, to do this sort of thing. So I'm interested in which one they pick. And it would be better than just going by branding because branding and URLs can also be uh, manipulated and faked to fool people into thinking they're looking at the original source. So this is potentially a better way to do it than just that. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Hello Robot was founded three years ago by former Google Director of Robotics Aaron Edsinger and Georgia Tech Robotics Professor Charlie Kemp. On Tuesday, Hello Robot introduced the Stretch Research Edition. It's a platform that really is a, a, a big pole with an arm on it, uh, aimed at research labs, corporate R&D, and startups. Stretch is a mobile manipulator robot. It has a single telescoping grabber for picking things up and putting things down attached to a central pole uh, that can move around a little bit as well. The arm is touch sensitive uh, and can handle items that weigh up to 1.5 kilograms. The grabber itself is not a human hand looking thing or even pincers. It's a pair of rubber cups and some metal springs. They modeled this on the grippers that are used by people with disabilities. They looked at what do people who need assistance use to grab things? Let's take the stuff that works for them and put it on the robot. Stretch will move on its own 34 by 33 centimeter wheelbase, uh, navigates around with a real sense depth sensing camera and a 340 degree LIDAR sensor. It uses a combination of ROS and Python and can handle voice commands uh, with some limited autonomy. Uh, it's capable of moving around a room, maybe grabbing and passing objects. There's a demo of it cleaning a counter uh, with a wet rag. Uh, it's not meant for you yet. The idea here is that Hello Robot wants to sell its stretch platforms to research organizations. So six stretch platforms have been sold to research labs so far. These kinds of platforms are usually heavy. This one's light. They're usually expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. This one costs $17,950. Uh, so there's an open source aspect to this as well. I think it's interesting what Hello Robot is doing here because it may not sound that impressive to you because you can't buy one and put it in your house. But what they're trying to do is say, we've created a really good platform that could be good for a lot of things. And like putting out an SDK with software, we want to give it to folks who can experiment with it and find applications for it. It's really interesting to see what result you get to when you don't start with a preconceived idea of what it should be. Because this is really just a poll with a pincer at the end uh, on an extent, I, I hesitate calling it an arm. It's just you know, another pull going off the main one that goes up. And um, it really looks like it is extremely capable and versatile. And I'm really curious, this is a very interesting approach. I'm very curious to see what people uh, come up with or companies or researchers come up with as users for this, because even on the small little video, it can do so many things that you wouldn't expect it to do when you're looking at it, because you're obviously trained as a human to expect uh, human behavior or human capabilities from something that yeah. looks like a human. This well, is completely different. I, I do want to bounce off that point that uh, it's very interesting because it actually has all the range of motions that you normally have in a human arm, but it's not structured like a human arm, which is generally like, when I think of robots in an automotive plant, it's a giant arm. If I'm looking at soft robots in a, a factory that puts together you know, fragile objects, it's an arm. 
this has the range of motion, right? You don't need to have joints. You just need a way to pivot, and it can pivot on its axis because it's on rollers, has an arm that can extend because it's on the telescoping uh, uh, device. It doesn't need all that, and that goes back to what Patrick said. If you just if if you get rid of the idea of it needs to look like an arm to do all these things and just say, what do we need to actually get this t task done? This is what we came up with. Yeah, I, I, I like this too because uh... – the other thing to consider is $17,950 sounds like a lot to me. Uh, I didn't pay that much for my car. But uh, if in a lab situation where you're used to having to budget hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, $17,000 is achievable in your budget and something you might be willing to take more risks with. You might be willing to try more things with it uh, because you're not like, that was a $500,000 piece of equipment. It's going to be hard to replace if, if, if something goes wrong. So I'm hoping that we will see more people uh, take take this to places they wouldn't have taken those more expensive versions of it. Plus, it's lighter weight. Uh, you can you can move it around and have it do more things well, anyway. And it's safer it, it, in a oh I'm sorry it's safer in an environment where you have small children or pets because it's not a lumbering 300 pound mm -hmm. device. Right. Or or even just other people. It, uh, I mean, this is going to be used not in places where small children and pets would be uh, right out of the gate. Uh, but I think that point still holds. E even in an industrial situation, it's not going to roll over somebody's foot and crush it. Yeah. For for, for people who aren't, uh, who are just audio listeners, this is really, imagine a, a Roomba with a pole going up uh, about two to three feet. And then in the middle of that, or a little bit higher, a pole uh, perpendicular to that with a pincer at the end. That's it. That's the robot. I, it looks uh, like a rolling hat rack. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love uh, f from the TechCrunch article that showed me, you know, a variety of ways of how it could clean my couch yeah. <laughs> or give me a glass of water right. or maybe take some laundry out of the, you know, it's, it's, yeah, there, there are these kind of mundane things that we don't necessarily say like, I need a robot for this because people just are used to doing it. But once you have something that is versatile, versatile enough and at the right price point, which it isn't yet, but, you know, again, early days, then that's where it gets interesting. Hey, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Oh, look, mailbag. Oh my gosh. Wow. Weird. Uh, no, Zach wrote in to chime in in our conversation uh, from yesterday about job requirements that sometimes didn't make a lot of sense. For example, a job requirement requiring you to have more experience in years than the software has been around. That doesn't make sense. Zach says, I've seen this a lot while looking for jobs. Usually it's a red flag for smaller companies, but when larger companies make this mistake, it does make me wonder, is it because they're forced to do a public listing before they could allow somebody within the company to take the position so they made it impossible? <clears throat> the other issue is just your requirements themselves. I've also seen impossible requirements, but I've seen requirements to have experience of the year different tools and languages were created that, that were different. This has made finding a job more difficult since I pretty much have to use most tools within a year of their creation and continue to use them for three plus years, which, unless you're really good at picking winners, is really hard to do. Not saying when filling out the applications that you have to click a check mark saying that you agree that you truly meet the requirements listed before submitting your application. Not all job listings are like this, but it seems to be at least in Zach's experience, about 20%. Zach says, I hope to find a realistic opportunity soon. Yeah, and Allison Sheridan uh, wrote in uh, with, uh, I think he's a good example of what Allison was pointing out. Allison says, hey guys, I heard you talking about bungled job application requirements for longer than the technology had been around. There's a fantastic episode of the Code Newbie podcast interviewing Aubrey Blanche about how to create equitable design. And by that, she means getting a diverse workforce and harnessing it correctly. The the reason it's relevant to your story is that she talks specifically about how making too many and too specific of requirements in a job description actually gets you worse candidates. Uh, and I think Zach's an example of that. Zach is probably a great candidate, but he's holding off applying for these things because he's like, well, I don't have 12 years of experience on software that was out for 12 years, so I guess I shouldn't apply. Well, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ali and Lisa Sanjabi, John Atwood, and Chris Benito. Also, thanks to the one, 
the only Patrick Beja. Patrick, what's been going on with your world? I have I have a feeling it has to do with working from home. Uh, I felt like uh, evil could evil for a second there. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed, you can go to workinsanity.net if you want to check out the Work Insanity podcast that Tom and I do together. It's uh, 15 minutes every Monday. And if you want to check out Le Rendez-vous Jeu or Le Rendez-vous Tech and you speak French, go to notpatrick.com. It's very easy. You get a link directly to your podcast app to subscribe to those shows. Uh, Le Rendez-vous Jeu and Le Rendez-vous Tech, just go to notpatrick.com and you're done. You're welcome. Ah, oh, that's so nice. And Work Insanity uh, season one just finished up. So if you've been waiting to jump in, now you get a complete season. You get the complete package, uh, episodes one through eight. So go and check that out right now. Also, uh, we know not all of you need a mask, but if you do, uh, we got them in the DTNS store. And who wouldn't want to walk around with the DTNS logo on their face? I know I do. Uh, look for me on the streets. Uh, you could be like me. Go check it out. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Thank you in advance. We'd love to hear your feedback. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Tune in if you can and find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Private Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>